we've got a problem. Ghostbuster. Ghostbuster. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one and only true Ghostbuster, right? <laughs> <laughs> and who do you praise when you get an answer? The, the Lord, isn't that right? He is worthy of all praise. Let's stand and sing. Now. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our Father, we are just thrilled to be able to come here today and praise your name. We have witnessed, even this week, the blessings that you have given to us. We can't even count all the blessings you've given to us this very week and that we're looking forward to in this coming week. And in the days ahead, we put our complete faith and trust in you. You're always faithful to us. You've always supplied all of our needs, and we know you've promised to do so from this day forward, for all of eternity, Father. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to, to do what only He could do, to save us from our sins, the guilt and penalty of sin. Thank you so much for this communion that we have with you on a daily basis. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated, and we're going to have a little different order of service today. We're going to go right now into the order of events, or the uh, calendar of events. There you go. I am so blessed and grateful that you didn't mistake me for the song leader. <laughs> That's it. Okay, you've got a bulletin, haven't you? Turn to the back page and you can read down through the calendar of events that are coming up. So, first of all, this evening we will have a uh, Sunday evening praise worship with meal. Now, you know Rob's gone. He is gone, but we will have a meal. All right. Yes, with dessert. With what? With <laughs> dessert. <laughs> yes. What if I'm off sugar? <laughs> no dessert for you. Not my problem. Yeah, it is the first one. <laughs> okay, and then tomorrow evening will be a diaper, diaper. Diaper. discipleship committee meeting. 
Uh, okay, yeah. All of y'all are going to be there? You. <laughs> I've got... I see it not be there, but it's on phone or present. I've got uh, an event. It's scheduled. It's written in stone. I've got a meeting tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Eddie's got one, too. So, y'all can work without me. You do anyway, so... <laughs> Uh, Wednesday night is game night, so at 6 p.m. Wednesday, come on down, play a game, and uh, watch me get beat. <laughs> Upcoming events, not this week, but next week will be uh, elders meeting and board meeting. So we delayed it a week because these CPAs think they need to work harder and longer. And uh, but their their season comes to a grinding halt on April 15th so anyway so we just delayed our we flip-flopped the dates for the uh, elders and board well board meeting basically the enclosed closet will be open the third Thursday uh, the 18th and it looks like we've got an anniversary of the James and Bridget Eve and uh, Mary Ann is going to have a birthday, another one. She's going to have another birthday. So you want to sing, you want to get up and sing happy birthday to us? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll, I'll sing an eclipse ticket though. <laughs> um, okay, I don't know what, again, thanks for not treating me as your song leader and you, you'll know why once I start you on a happy birthday. So let's sing happy birthday to Mary Ann. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday God bless you, happy birthday to you. You will stand up and say anything? I can see that you are not willing. Not about my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so... Okay, that's pretty much it for a calendar of events uh, the next week or two. So, mm -hmm. anybody have anything to add? I, yes? I do have something else to add. The 27th of April, we'll be having the, I think this is the third annual, Very Massive Memorial Golf Scramble at the Country Club. And it's $50 per person, and it benefits the food bank. Okay. 27th of April. Okay. Give a team to give. You have to have a set of gloves to do this? <laughs> it helps. <laughs> I could throw it better than I can hit it. Okay, anyone else? Boy, did we have a lesson this morning. I know you did. If Nancy <laughs> just could have been there to hear it. Wow. <laughs> she did it, didn't she? But I'm not calling her out on anything. So. <laughs> okay, that's it. Well, it is good to be together today, isn't it? Yes. Good to be together. Praise the Lord. I want to mention that, I, I know I'll forget otherwise, but Joe and I are going to be in Houston all uh, week this week. Yeah, I'm with our kids in Spring, Texas, and so we won't be here Monday night either or, or Wednesday night. But uh, we're hoping to be back, uh, you know, in case the eclipse gets us all. And if the, if the eclipse goes through and none of us are destroyed and the planet survives, we'll all be back here next week, right? <laughs> I'll be back here again next week. That'll, that'll just be awesome. But uh, let's stand and say the pledge. And we're going to have a song then by Stephanie. And uh, we're looking forward to that. The, this pledge relates to that and the scripture reading afterwards. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Thank you. You may be seated. Stephanie, if you would. I've already turned down for you. Okay. No. Okay. Except Jim's a gossiper. <laughs> I got a text. He 
said, I was talking to someone and they said, you sing. And I said, well, it sounds like someone's been gossiping. <laughs> so uh, I was going to look up some scripture about gossiping this morning and throw it at him, but I didn't do that. So we'll just know that We're someone good. led him down that road. He got led that way. And <laughs> We're just spreading the good news, right? <laughs> Well, well, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Stephanie.
9 through 13. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all He has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all his promises and faithful in all he does. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Wow, pretty moving morning so far. That was wonderful, Stephanie. Um, we'll move to our praises and our joys and concerns at this time. Do we have any updates that we need to know about this morning? Come on, help me. So I did hear um, John Watson passed away. Yep, I did too. I heard that. Max Brown also passed away. Okay. Yes, Brian. Um, Mike is sick again. Oh no. So we can go back to see. Okay. Um, Just more complications with. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think he needs a uh, lab work and to you know speak to the doctors who've been treating. Okay. Well, keep us keep us updated. Yes, Kathy. I think uh, Randall Lewis is not going to be good. Yeah, I was going to bring him up here in just a moment, but we need to, to keep him in our prayers. He's somebody that's been in our community and done a lot for a lot of people in our community, so we need to lift him up to the Lord, if at all possible, uh, in our prayers for sure. Al Partita had a yes. memorial service for Al yesterday. He was a long time with the memorial hospital as a radiology, run the radiology department. It was Al Partina. Yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, Help. Partina. T A. Is that Partina. pretty close? Partina. Partina. P A R T I D A. D A. P A D A. Okay. And he passed away. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when was that service, Eddie? Yes. Yesterday. Yesterday. Yesterday was the service. Yeah. Saint Helens. Max is, is going to be tomorrow in Elgin, and it's just going to be a great sight. Okay. Max Brown in Elgin okay. tomorrow okay. afternoon. Okay. Well, I think John Watson is tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Okay. Okay. Do we have any others? Updates on anyone? Got a good chance of rain they're talking about this week. We sure need that. That would be a joy. Anything else? The eclipse. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's a joy. I don't know. <laughs> it's a joy because I'm going on a road trip with my little, my little boys. <laughs> oh, y'all taking a road trip? Is Ed going with you? Or is he going? Our, our trip, huh? Oh, he's, oh he's, yeah, it's going, it's going to. I said, I hope he holds school because I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to inform them of that. Yeah. Are you going down to Dallas? Or? Time to. We did a big long road trip in 2017. Are you going we're to back. Dallas or where are you going? We went, we're we going to the southeastern Oklahoma. Oh, okay. We're going to meet his family. His family, his nieces have a place they reserve. So. Oh, okay. No, I don't think. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I'm just going for fun. <laughs> fun to be with my family. It was a joy last week. We had an Easter service, of course, and all the baptisms that we had was just wonderful. Um, it was very moving, and I thought Jim did a great job, and it's, it's wonderful to see everyone uh, committing to a faithfulness from now on to eternity. So it's wonderful. Any others at this time? It's a joy. All right, turn it over. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are still reveling in the wonderful blessings that we had last week for our Easter service. It was wonderful to have so many family and uh, members here and friends here. And 
and then the commitments that people made to the Lord. And we know that you work very in, in wonderful ways through the activities that we do, even here in this physical world. It's not all just about an academic knowledge that we have about you, but we experience you. We experience your joy. We experience your love, your forgiveness, your salvation. That's why we're here today, Father, because we have experienced something very, very real. And uh, we just love sharing with other people, sharing with those who have also experienced it, uh, seeing other people come into an understanding of what it means to really experience the glory of Jesus Christ himself. So we just uh, are so thankful for that time last week and thankful for the fact that you're working in our lives all the time. We are praying about this eclipse that's coming up tomorrow, Father. We know that you work through the, the sun, the moon, and stars, and you always have, and you always will. So we're anxious to see what you're going to do tomorrow. And we know there'll be a lot of people traveling and a lot of people expecting different things. And we just pray that you'd be working in all of it, Father, to accomplish your plan and purpose. We know you will. We have absolute confidence in that. And we're just anxious to see your will being done. We are praying for those who've lost loved ones, Father. We're praying for the Watson family, the Brown family, and the Petita family. We ask you to be blessing them with the comfort and peace that comes from the Holy Spirit of God and from the presence of the Lord. It's just wonderful to know that in your presence there's fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. All the good things that we have from you are things that we experience now and forever. We're praying for those, Father, who have health concerns. We're continuing to pray for Mike, Father. We're disappointed to hear that he's had a setback. Uh, it was wonderful to see him last week, and we're just praying that you would provide for total health and total recovery for him. We're praying for Randall Lewis to bless him with health and strength. We know that you can provide the, the healing that's needed for both Randall and Mike, and for all of us. Father, we realize that we're in a constant state of healing because we're constantly being bombarded, bombarded by various uh, things that can cause illnesses. And uh, you have given us wonderful immune systems that make it possible for us to fight off most of the infections, most of the bacteria and viruses that come into our body. And you're just amazing in how you provide such wonderful protection for us. We give you the praise and the glory for it, Father. You know, a great immune system doesn't come about by accident. It's something you planned. You did a wonderful job. And so we, we thank you for it. And we pray, Father, for the doctors that have to deal with the various illnesses that do come about. And we're praying that you give them skill and wisdom and they would give you the praise and glory whenever you provide the healing that's needed. We're thankful for our children and young people, Father. Thank you so much again for those who made a public commitment to you last week in their water baptism, and we're just continuing to pray for them. We're praying for the soup Saturday and clothes closet, praying for Operation Care in the Food Bank, praying for the Gideons. We're so thankful for Eddie and Julie Lane. It's wonderful to have them with us whenever they can be. We know they're ministering to many, many people and have wonderful teams that they work with around the world. And so we're continuing to pray for them. We pray for our country. I ask you to give our leaders incredible wisdom, just an amazing wisdom from you. And Father, we are just thankful that we can trust you in all things that are accomplished in our country and in the countries around the world. We're praying for those that serve in the military, Father. We ask you to bless them with a sense of your presence, those that know you, Father, help them to really depend upon you more and more, lean upon you, to be able to trust you in everything that they do as they serve our country in the military. For those that don't know you, Father, we pray that you'd work out circumstances that would open up their eyes to see Jesus Christ and that they would have a willing heart to receive the truth of Jesus Christ. And we are praying for Terry K. Pettyjohn, Barbara Miller, Katie Miller, and Wanda Ellis, ask you to bless them in a special way today as well. We pray that you would bless us all as we say together the prayer the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's be turning to our communion hymn, and we're going to sing the first verse twice. It'll be our first and second verse. Come to the table, 464.
to Rita this morning, and uh, she was telling me something very interesting. You know, she said, most of us don't expect to live until we're 90 years old. <laughs> but she said, what a blessing. What a blessing. And not only to live until you're 90, but to be blessed with good health, able to walk, able to drive, able to get around. And isn't it wonderful when you just think about the things that God has done for us? We all have so much to be thankful for. It's why when we give, we bring the sacrifice of praise. <laughs> it's the sacrifice of praise because He's been so good to us. So I pray that you'll be blessed as you give today. Doxology. Last week we talked about the fact that when we put our faith in Christ, we're baptized by the Holy Spirit of God into His death, burial, and resurrection, and we become a new creation in Christ. So now all we have to do is take possession of the promise. Take possession of that which God has given to us. Reckon it to be so, is what the Apostle Paul says. Reckon it to be so. That it is true. It's something we have to claim. Well, I wanted to look a little bit this morning about this promise that was given to Abraham. What an amazing promise given to Abraham. Genesis 15 says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. He's emphasizing it's not just about the promise, Abraham. It's, it's me. I'm, it all comes from me. I'm your, I'm your shield. I am your reward. But Abraham is reminded of his promise, the promise that was given to him that he would inherit the land and have descendants. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? Well, you know, he's gotten to think about this promise that God gave to him and that you'll have descendants and he started to think, well, maybe I misunderstood. Have you ever done that? <laughs> Where you think God has told you something pretty definite, but then as time goes on, you start to believe, well, maybe I didn't really understand that correctly. And so he's beginning to question 
what the Lord had told him about this particular promise. He says, I guess maybe what you were talking about was this servant of mine, Eliezer. He's the one that's going to be the heir of all that I have and even the promises that have been, that have been given. And they said, you have given me no children. Who else could it be? I'm, look how old I am. I'm not likely to have any more children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Well, that would be hard to believe, wouldn't it, when you're as old as he is, to be told you're going to have a child. You're old, your wife is old, it's not something that would naturally happen, but I'm God. I can do whatever I want to do, and I'm telling you, it's going to happen. So he took Abram outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, which obviously you can't, they're too numerous to count. They couldn't even begin to see all the stars, could we? Know it. We know now a lot more about how many stars are out there. <laughs> then we can't even begin to see them. He says, yes, look up if you can count them. Uh, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. He says, you're going to have so many descendants, so many descendants. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. That's the power of faith. It's one of the most powerful things in all the Word of God. It's one of the most precious things in the Word of God. How can you possibly be uh, righteous enough to go to heaven? He says the only way that can happen is through faith. When you believe what God says in the Word of God, He says when you believe that, God counts it as righteousness on your part. God sees you as righteous. That's just how precious faith is to God, to believe what God says. And so... He says, yes, that's what, and isn't it interesting how the Apostle Paul uh, really leaned on this verse? We have some people, I remember even as a child, I was told, well, in the Old Testament, people were saved by the law, and in the New Testament, they're saved by grace. But then as I started looking at the Scriptures, studying the Scriptures, I began to realize that all of Paul's arguments about salvation by grace through faith were based on Abraham. He said, Abraham was saved by faith. So, you know, if Paul is basing his argument on people in the Old Testament, he's really basically saying people have always been saved that way. And he goes on to say nobody could ever be saved by the law. So people in the Old Testament couldn't be saved by the law. People in the New Testament can't be saved by the law. We can never live up to the law. We can't fulfill the law. So the only way to be saved is by faith. Paul even goes ahead to say that Abraham was uh, saved by faith, 400 years before the law was ever given. 430 years, he said, before the law was ever given. So the law couldn't have been a part in Abraham's salvation. And then he goes on to say it was actually given before circumcision, the sign of being a Jew, the sign of being in the nation of Israel, the, the nation of Israel, the nation chosen by God to be their God's people. He says it was given before circumcision. For circumcision. You know when circumcision was given? Genesis 17. He noticed this is this was told he was counted as righteous before that sign of circumcision was ever given to Abraham. So both points, he says, not by the law, not by religious rituals, by faith you are saved and accounted as righteous in the sight of God. But now look at what he goes on to say. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land, to take possession of it. To take possession. Well, this is another thing that he's going to have to really live by faith. Why is that? Did, did he ever take possession of it? Did Abraham take possession of this land? We see later on in this very same chapter where God tells him, you're not going to take possession of it in your lifetime. What does that mean? It means he's going to have to be raised from the dead to take possession of it, right? So he says, he says, you will take possession of it. God's word is always true. It doesn't always take place exactly the way we expect it to take place. Maybe when Abraham heard this, he thought he's going to possess it in his lifetime. But God goes on to tell him, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, there's this ritual going on between Abraham and I, between Abraham and God to confirm this promise. 
there's sort of a ritual going on. He says, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. This animal had already been split apart and separated. And so this blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces of this sacrifice. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. Now that's a large piece of land, isn't it? He's, he's saying specifically, this is going all the way from Egypt to the Euphrates River, up to Persia. All this land in between is, is going to be yours. Your descendants, I'll give this land. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, don't think that you're going to inherit while you're alive as a human being. You're going to be buried. You're going to go to be with your ancestors at a good old age. You're going to live a long life, but you're not going to possess the land while you're still alive. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. He says, I'm going to give this land to you, but the Amorites that occupy the land now, I'm not going to punish them right now because their sin is not that bad yet. I'm going to wait. I'm patient. I'm long-suffering. I know they're not going to repent. They're not going to come to me. They're not going to believe in me. Their sin is going to get worse and worse. Does it ever uh, make you think maybe that has an attitude like us, our situation today? <laughs> you know, God is patient, isn't he? He's waiting. He's waiting. He says, it's going to get worse and worse. Paul actually said that as he wrote to Timothy. It's going to get worse and worse. But God is patient. He's waiting. He's wanting people to get saved in the meantime as we preach the gospel to people. But God tells Abraham, yes, I'm going to give this land after you die to your descendants. But he's already told Abraham that he would possess the land. So he never did possess that land in his lifetime in a physical sense. But did he possess it in a spiritual sense? This is very, very interesting because in the book of Hebrews, we find that that is proclaimed. That Abraham did possess it during his lifetime in a spiritual sense. How did that happen? By faith, Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. So the writer of Hebrews is looking back on Abraham and saying, you know, what faith Abraham had to live in this land all of his life. I mean, he lived a long time, but he never owned any land. He didn't own any of this land. It was promised to him, but he never was able to own it. All the other Amorites, all the other nations... They, they owned the land. When he had to bury his wife, he had to negotiate to find a, a, a cave to bury his wife in. He didn't own this land. He, he was content to live as a stranger in a foreign country. What in his country? He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, even his, his child and his uh, grandchild. They didn't, uh, they didn't own anything either. They lived in tents who were heirs with him of the same promise. God had given them this promise, but they didn't own it. Do you see how he's building this case for living by faith? Even if you don't have right now what God has promised to you, you still believe it. You still keep living by faith. It's not that you have to have everything right now to believe the promise of God. The promise of God will always come true. Always come true. But what about this possession of it while you're still alive? He says... Abraham actually did possess it in a spiritual sense. Verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations. He was looking for, he, he's not looking for a tent, is he? He's looking for a city with foundations, something that's durable, something that's going to last, last forever. And this city, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham, while he's living as a stranger on, the, on this earth in a foreign country, He's been given a great promise that he will inherit this land. He knows he's not going to inherit it during his lifetime, but he has a firm picture in his mind. God has given it to him. God has given him a perfect picture in his mind of the city of the future. The city of the New Jerusalem will come down out of heaven onto the earth. We see more and more description of it, especially in the book of Revelation, about this great city of Jerusalem that will come down out of heaven to the earth. And Abraham saw it. Abraham had a vision of it. And you know, when he, is, when he had a vision of it and when he believed it, he actually possessed it, didn't he? In a sense, he possessed that land already because he believed what God said. 
And that's the way we are. We have certain promises that are given to us. This expectation that we'll be raised from the dead. And actually, I think we have the same expectation that Abraham does to be in the New Jerusalem. When this New Jerusalem comes down, it's not only Abraham and his physical descendants, but Abraham and his spiritual descendants will inherit this, this city, this great city. So we can have a firm picture in our mind of the same city that Abraham had. We're probably not going to inherit it in our lifetime. We're more likely to than Abraham was, though. God hadn't actually told us that we're going to die and go to be with our ancestors. This, all of this fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham could actually happen before we die. And I'm already 70 years old, and I'm still thinking it might happen. <laughs> so, uh, tell her correct me, she'll say, no, you're 72. So, <laughs> but I'm still expecting it, and I'm still possessing it. You know, as you picture it in your mind, it, it becomes very real to you, and it's something that you hold on to. You cling to it by faith, knowing that the Word of God declared it, and the promise of God is absolutely sure. That even if we die before any of this comes true, we will be raised from the dead to see it, raised from the dead to inherit it. This inheritance that was promised to Abraham is our inheritance too. It has been given to us. That's one of the primary ministries of the Apostle Paul, to tell Gentiles that they can also inherit these great promises that were given to Abraham if they have the same faith as Abraham. To believe something that you can't see to believe something that you only see in your mind because it's something that's described in the Word of God. That's why it's so important to stay in the Word. Uh, Jay is always telling me, read the Word every day. Read the Word every day. It's so important. It's so valuable. We need constant reinforcement. Why? Because we're constantly getting reinforcement for the world, isn't that right? I mean, it's constant. 24 hours a day, bombardment from the world of a totally different perspective. And so we need at least some time every day where we reconfirm in our minds these promises that were given to us so that we're actually living in that spiritual reality as we live in this world. That's what Abraham did. He was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And as time went on, the Jews were given more and more information about this resurrection that was implied back in Genesis chapter 15. There had to be a resurrection, but God didn't say it. But we see more and more information given about it as we go through. One of the things that I love to see is in Isaiah chapter 24 through 27. Some very interesting prophecies given by Isaiah. He said, see, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. Isaiah is talking to the Jewish people. They, he knows there's a great judgment coming. Uh, about a hundred years after him is when uh, the Babylonians came down and took them away into captivity and totally destroyed the city of Jerusalem. But guess what Isaiah say? He didn't say they're going to destroy the city of Jerusalem, did he? What did he say? He said he's going to destroy the whole earth. He's talking about a great judgment that is going to come way in the future, the ultimate final judgment. So this judgment is actually future for us too. It hasn't come yet. Isaiah saw it. He said, this great judgment is coming. The Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. He said, there is a great final judgment that will come upon the earth. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. He said, Satan is not going to escape this great judgment that comes. But Satan is alive and well. Did you know how wrote a... I think how Lindsay was named, he wrote a book, Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. And he is. Satan is very, very active in the world today. But there's a day of judgment for Satan as it is for the rest of the evil inhabitants of the world. He says, in that day the Lord will punish the powers in heaven above and the kings on the earth below. I, I can't even imagine what Isaiah is thinking as he sees this ultimate final judgment of the earth. In that day the Lord will thresh from the flowing Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt. Do you remember that from Genesis? He says this great judgment that God is going to bring is over the whole earth, but he says specifically it will take place from the wadi of Egypt to the Euphrates. See, so God is saying to Israel that this judgment upon the earth is also going to affect Israel. Some people think, well, the nation of Israel is God's chosen people. He's not going to punish them. He's always going to bless them. No, he's only going to bless the believing Jews. The believing Jews. 
There is a great judgment coming for unbelieving Jews just like there is a great judgment for unbelieving Gentiles. This judgment will, will be over the whole earth and it will be over that land of Palestine where the unbelieving Jews will also be purged from this earth, preparing that land for the believing Jews and for the return of Christ. That's something that's important for all of us to remember, especially in our political climate today. We support Israel. It's God's will for us to support the nation of Israel. But we also realize that only the believing Jews will inherit the kingdom. Only those who believe in Jesus Christ will inherit the kingdom. God is preparing everything else, all the things that you see right now with unbelieving Jews. God is preparing it for this day. We don't know how that's going to take place, but he's preparing every situation so that this great judgment can come upon the whole world and upon the nation of Israel. He says, now notice this, he says, flowing from the Euphrates to the Wadi of Egypt, and you, Israel, will be gathered up one by one. Now, this is very interesting because very seldom in the Old Testament do you see anything that's individual. It's all about the nation will be judged, the nation will be judged, the nation will be this, the nation will be that. But he says this is one of those things, when this judgment comes, God is going to gather true Israel, true believers, one by one. See, that means it's individual faith. It doesn't matter what family you're from. It doesn't matter what church you belong to. It doesn't matter what your race is. Every single individual will be judged by whether they believe in Jesus Christ or not. One by one. And guess what that gathering is? It's a rapture. It's exactly the same term that Jesus used in Matthew 24 when he said the Son of Man will come from heaven and he will gather his elect from the four winds of the earth. There's a, a gathering before the judgment. Before this great judgment takes place, there's going to be a gathering of the elect. Jesus defines it as the gathering of the elect from the four winds of the earth. Not just those who live in Israel, but believers from all over the world. Believers from all over the world, from the four winds. He says there's going to be a rapture before, so the great judgment will not be for those who believe. The Revelation tells us we're going to be caught up to be with Jesus Christ in the heavens and then return with him after the judgment to set up the great and glorious kingdom. On verse 13 it says, And in that day a great trumpet will sound. A great trumpet will sound when this gathering takes place. Jesus confirmed that. There's going to be a great trumpet when the, the saints are gathered from the four winds. Isaiah is seeing some amazing things, isn't he? And in that day a great trumpet will sound. Those who were perishing in uh, Assyria and those who were exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. He said, yes, there is a great day coming. There is a wonderful, glorious kingdom coming. And people from all over the world that, that survive, believers from all over the world, will come to worship the Lord in Jerusalem. So we lay hold of these promises, just like Abraham did. We lay hold of them. We don't have them right here. We don't live in that kingdom now, but in our hearts we do. In our hearts we do, because by faith we receive the promises of God. It's a wonderful thing to know that we can put our total faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We're always moving on to higher ground in our individual lives. And think about that day when we rule and reign with Christ in His glorious kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the promises of the Word of God. They are sure. We have absolute confidence that what you say will take place. Even though sometimes it looks like, humanly speaking, it couldn't possibly be like Abraham. He couldn't imagine how that could possibly be, when he, that he would have a son. But just the fact that you said it, he believed it. And that's the very situation we find ourselves in, Father. Because you say it in your word, we believe it. And we know we're constantly moving on to higher ground through faith in Jesus Christ. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let's sing one verse of higher ground. 549.
tonight for six o'clock service. I think we're having ribs, uh, potato salad, beans, dessert. So come and join us. And we're going to worship the Lord. We're going to worship the Lord together. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.